What is up, my friend? Welcome to episode number 48 of the Anthony John Hanks podcast. I reached out to the CEO of the Subi Zimmerman Enterprise, who just so happens to be one of the select few people that a coach and guide at a deep level. And we've been jamming for nearly three years at the time of this recording. And I watched as she continues to lead and grow their team uh, into like six figure weeks. They're just doing great. They're just like growing, adding more recurring revenue. And it's just really, really inspiring. And she's one of the best people I know at building and leading and managing a virtual team. So I thought, why not have her on the podcast to share some of her wisdom with you? So if you're at this place in your business where it's like time to bring on virtual team members or you have them and you're wanting to manage them, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Anthony John Amix Podcast, the one and only podcast designed to help you become unstoppable in life and business. My name is Anthony John Amix. My friends call me AJ. And my goal with this podcast is to help you remember who you truly are so you can maintain your center in the chaos, embody your potential, and unlock freedom in your life and business. That being said, let's get into today's show. All right, welcome back. If you're a big fan of what we talk about on this podcast every single week, then you absolutely cannot miss being a part of my Facebook community called Shift 101. Every single week, I deliver more free training on how to destroy mental blocks, embody your greatest potential, and unlock riches in your life and business, and it's 100% free to join. All you have to do is go over to ajamix.com slash community and hit that little join button. That's it. So head on over to ajamix.com slash community to get access to all of the free training inside that community and also to connect with nearly 300 other amazing people who are committed to creating their version of freedom. Now, let me tell you a little bit about today's guest. She's, number one, a freaking rock star. She's the magic behind Sue B. Zimmerman, the Instagram expert. You may remember her from episode number 12. Sue's all about teaching small business owners how to become and continue to be the go-to authority in their industry by using Instagram marketing strategies to establish and grow an engaged Instagram following that actually converts into sales. And Morgan is the CEO of Sue's company and is responsible for leading and managing the entire team from hiring, firing, creating processes, coming up with strategies, setting goals. I mean, pretty much everything it comes to running the business. And they call her the Morganizer because she's so good at organizing things into structures and leading the team. Now, if that's not cool enough, She's also super young, like she's been helping Sue grow the business since she was in college. So if you currently have a virtual team to manage or if you're thinking about creating one, you're going to be able to glean a lot of wisdom from Morgan. So with that being said, let's bring her on to the podcast. Morgan, welcome to the podcast. I don't know why I said podcast, but you know, whatever. It is what it is. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. So I'm excited to have this conversation uh, with you specifically today. Um, But before we do that, can you believe like it's been nearly three years since you and I have been working together and your whole team? Three years? I know. It's It's wild. Thank goodness. We've covered a lot in three years. Yes, we have. (laughs) (laughs) So today we're going to talk about how to manage a virtual team. I can't think of anybody else uh, that would be better fit to talk about this topic than you. But before we do that, I want to kind of like hear a little bit about how you learned to manage a virtual team, uh, because I'm pretty sure like you didn't go to school, uh, you didn't read some type of book to learn how to manage a virtual team, you like weren't birthed into the world already knowing how to manage a virtual team. So what is, what's been that journey? How'd you come to learn how to do this? It's funny that you say you didn't go to school for it and weren't birds into the world to it, because that's what my whole team would say is that it's kind of an, an, a natural thing thing of mine, which I'm grateful that they believe that. Um, I fell into online business and are running a virtual uh, business accidentally. Um, I did go to school for management. So um, my background is in systems engineering and engineering management. So the project management, communication, presentation kind of part of this, I did go to school for. Um, But in, in online business in, in general, it, it just kind of happened to me. So I'm sure that you've shared in the intro that I work with Suhi Zimmerman. Um, we teach Instagram uh, marketing to small business owners. And uh, we started a little more than seven years ago. And I started as Sue's like kind of assistant right hand and slowly through, I mean, a lot of experience, I built up this team. Now I manage anywhere from like 11 to 13 people in a given nice. day. Um, and yeah, we're doing great. We serve thousands of students online. 
How old were you when you started? 20. Yeah. Because you started when you were yeah. in college, like you were working out of your dorm room and stuff or I your did. apartment or whatever yes. you were in. Yes. I, um, we started the business when I was a junior in college and um, basically did full-time school and worked for the business as much as I could outside of that. Summers, weekends, whatever we could do. Nice. So what was that pivot point for you where you were like, look, me and Sue can't do this any longer by ourselves. Like we got to find some help. Like what, what was that pivot point for you guys? Well, it's funny because our first hire was actually meant to help me get some of the admin work off my back, which like, it's just silly now when um, I'm responsible for like the whole business's strategy and producing all of our education products and things like that and running our team that I was just looking for someone to help me book flights. Like we were <laughs> just, we had too much on our plate. And um, so anyone helping with Sue's schedule, um, cause we were speak Sue was speaking a lot. We were traveling a lot of conferences is what I needed. So the first kind of pivot point was I can't do all of this alone and I can't be working on the things that would really move the needle if I am sorting through flight times. That's, <laughs> That's how it started. Yeah. And so that, did you guys bring on the admin person or did that person morph into something different? They uh, completely different. It's not, not where we ended up at all, but it's certainly um, what the first ask was, was can't the way that Morgan is kind of a jack of all trades, which as any entrepreneur knows is what you kind of have to wear all these different hats. Um, could you kind of come in and help? Can you pick up whatever it is that we need you to juggle? Um, so that's where, how it started. Why do you think learning to manage a virtual team has been important for your life and the business that you're leading? Uh, at this point, it's required. Um, so when I started, like I said, I was in college. I had no intention of this being my real life at all. Um, I expected to graduate and have a corporate job. And instead, I uh, our business gained traction. So at every kind of milestone at college graduation, when I wanted to go to grad school, um, at graduating from grad school and getting into going to another um, like kind of stage, um, the business was still growing. And so that's why I was able to stay on. Um, but I guess part of it is, like you're saying, learning to manage the virtual team was required in order to continue to grow the business and continue to have it support Sue, myself, and the profession that I wanted to have, if that, if that makes any sense. What was the profession you wanted to have? Well, now I don't even know, but I wanted a, I wanted a real job where I felt important and I made good money. And turns out I have that while wearing pajamas. So awesome. we're all good. Nice. <laughs> nice. Now, you know, I think a lot of people, they hear the word virtual team and they think like outsourcing to the Philippines or outsourcing to some other country. Sure. Yet I, I have a little bit inside look at your guys' business and you guys really um, aren't really doing that. You guys are doing something different. You're hiring people stateside. So why did you choose to go that path rather than a different path? Well, the first thing is, and um, I, of course I want to caveat it with, I only can speak to my own experience. So if you are winning at having a, uh, outsourced team out of the country, then congrats. I'm happy for you. Um, but first off we tried it and it was uncomfortable. So there was something about wanting the level of relationship, of communication, of camaraderie, um, that we didn't get by working with a team that was so in a different time zone as us, um, maybe had different language barriers, um, and only would work inside, inside of virtual portals. So I know people have major success with it, but we found a lot of friction, weren't happy with then because of that friction, what quality we were able to get to. And it was less fulfilling. So I can... I never really think about the fact that I only run a virtual team. I run a business with women that work all over the country and I get to support a bunch of families and they're just my team. I don't even think about the fact that I was um, building it a little bit differently. So I'm, I think we really like to support um, women who are, 
looking to make that difference, you have a really big skill, and we, and we put our team at the center of our brand. And so having people close by that we're able to connect with in person when we can um, and kind of build a culture, um, it was clear in year two, three, whatever, when we were playing with other uh, arrangements that we were happiest getting to spend that time together and build that bond. Nice. Now, do you guys get together once a year, once a quarter? Like, how do you guys bond as a team? Um, early on, it was 100% once a quarter, if not more, um, because when you have a smaller group, like the fact that Sue was traveling places and speaking, it meant that I could just go follow her. You know, it was just me or one other person. So um, now that we have more people, we try and do twice a year. Um, and I'm going to try and keep to it this year. We'll see what the summer holds. <laughs> sure. And hopefully you can travel. We'll, we'll see mm -hmm. about that. <laughs> exactly. Hopefully you can get everybody together and it's not like, no, only five people together. That's it. Exactly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Who gets the chopping block when there's only 10 that I'm allowed to have at the Cape House? Like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You didn't make the Corona list. Sorry. Maybe right. next Sorry. <laughs> So how do you guys go about finding your team members? Um, it's, I was talking to someone yesterday about what my next hire would be actually. And I had mentioned how part of it is knowing what you're looking for next. And so you just start kind of putting those like seeds in with conversations and networks. And part of it, I feel like has been the right people coming into our lives at the right time. So a lot of it has been networking and reaching out to other um, online business owners and who they've liked working with the certain skills and seeing what other availability they have or if that person knows someone who knows someone. Um, this online world is very weird in that it's very big, but also very small. Totally. And there's so many awesome communities a part of it. So um, we also reach out to our own students and do like normal hiring processes, like put out a job listing and see who comes in, you know. So when you say networking, do you just mean reaching out to somebody via direct message and you're like, yo, we're looking for so-and-so, who do you know? And they're like, oh, da 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 And you're like, oh, awesome, mm -hmm. thanks. And then they connect to you and that's essentially what networking is when you have an online business. Totally, yeah. No, a DM or a Facebook message, shoot an email. And I think it's also important to, like, it doesn't have necessarily have to be someone that does exactly what you do as well. Um, even just, like, someone else who has a business who, who ever asks for anything out online will know someone who knows someone. Um, the other thing that, because we get asked so much, like, Sue, how do you get a Morgan? The answer is because you know, I need a Morgan. And I mean, I was 20 years old. I knew nothing about this. I wasn't like internet marketing, didn't know how to run a six figure launch, didn't, I didn't know any of those things. Sue just found someone that she trusted, that she believed had promise and um, invested in me from $15 an hour to almost a seven figure company. So when someone's like, I need to find a Morgan, I'm, I tell them to look like, in your community, Sue was um, my camp friend's mom. You know, we love our camp <laughs> community still. Um, go to your local colleges, your church, you know, your YMCA, like whatever it is, like, and creating that intern could potentially end up becoming something else as well. For somebody who's looking for that person, and like maybe they're starting, maybe they're like Sue, where they're, they're genius at what they do and they teach, um, but they need somebody to come and organize the back end and the business and the funnels and the systems and they want to groom that person, they could find them. How would they even start? Like, how would they, I mean, they're just like, uh, run it, figure it out, or do they got to give some guidance? Like, where would they start? It's interesting. Um, well, in terms of just deciding what to outsource next, I think you have to do a lot of documentation and understand like what's happening in your day and what processes are you repeating over and over again and what do you have where the process is you're comfortable enough with the outcome and comfortable enough with the steps that you feel that you could teach it to someone else. Like I think those are often um, important steps to make when delegating. Um, Truly though, that exact question, it really depends on the person because 
I'm self-taught and Sue didn't know any of the things that I now know for the business. So I feel bad that I'm a little bit of this anomaly here, but um, I don't think you're an anomaly. I, I'm, dude, I'm well, self-taught with all the stuff that I know, you know, if okay, somebody good. would have brought me on at 20 years old, like I would have figured it out. I always have. I remember working for an ad agency. I knew nothing about an ad agency. Uh, they hired me and they just, their, their hiring question was like guerrilla marketing or structured advertising. I was like guerrilla all day. Like I mailed socks to people in college to be able to close some deals for a thing. And she's like, cool, you're a hustler, you're a grinder, come on board. And it's just me and her. And I would just figure it out. Like I would just figure it out. I'd go, you know, I don't know. So I think there are people out there who are just hungry and who will just yeah. kind of figure it out um, and work really hard. Yeah. Resourcefulness is like number one on my list. Like when hiring resourcefulness, ability to problem solve, like being open to having those conversations is... Th that's when I find someone that really clicks and works with our team. Cause you have that again, entrepreneur mindset that you're a little open and it's, it helps. Yeah, it does help. I like those people too. Um, mm -hmm. how much do you think somebody should expect to pay somebody when they're hiring team members? Like you start, you said you started at like 15 and then you've worked your way up. Uh, you hire people right now. So like, what's that range? How do you guys kind of do it? It's interesting because I think it depends on a couple of things. I think it depends on the task, their skill and experience in it, and how important getting that thing done right now is to you. So, um, and then on top of that, what is the current market value of that and how much competition is out there for that person to get hired by someone else and not get to work with you? So it's a lot. Um, I mean, I can like sh shout out numbers in terms of like VA versus this. Sure. automation but um for me it, it has been um i think it's important to consider especially like when you're if you're someone who does consulting and price yourself you know you're not paying for my hour of work you're paying for the fact that i've been doing this for five years and do it in half the time that you would be able to do it so it's it's a big question <laughs> so you just like google you go find kind of what the average wage is have, you know, once you have an interview yeah. and find the person, then just kind of negotiate win-win uh, for them essentially. And then from there, just keep create, if you like them, create a plan for growth and them kind of staying, uh, to use Jim Collins, kind of an illustration, them staying on the bus and being in the right seat and really enjoying be, being part of the culture. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, exactly. So, I mean, we do do a lot of research around like what we would expect that title to be. And then what on like glassdoor.com or whatever those resources where the employees I'll talk, um, like what's the average, um, salary for that in your zip code and then playing with like how much, um, more flexibility or how many different responsibilities would be from that job title. Um, but it, it's really important what you said about making sure someone feels like there's a win-win because, um, it sets the stage for your entire relationship. Um, and I think, I mean, my management style is always to err on being more generous and more, um, giving to my team. Um, I love bonuses and presents and maybe it's because it's also my love language, but, um, I your team is to, now to me, now that I have this big operation, it's everything that I have people that I trust to do what needs to get done. And so like, I guess one of my main things is creating that loyalty so that like if you're taking care of well by me, then you don't want to go somewhere else. And yeah. it's a good thing, you know, yeah. so yeah. What tools do you really enjoy using to manage the team? Gosh, every tool in the book, right? Um, we use Zoom, you know, um, to video conference. Um, we are, our business lives on Slack. Thank goodness when that came around, coming out of the inbox is great. Um, we use Trello, which is a project management tool um, that we can talk about a little bit. Um, loom.com is really easy like video tutorials i think it's um really useful when you can hear someone's voice as much as possible especially when like that relationship and their motivation to get done what you need to get done and do it at a high level is so important 
um, when you work virtually, I think I could sp- like, I can think I can speak for my team when that, like, they still feel really connected to me and Sue and what's going on day to day and, um, like the mission and instead of feeling isolated cause you're at home. Um, so all of these tools, focusing on video, focusing on audio messages. Um, we use Voxer, the app, um, to voice message as much as possible um, so that they can like hear your tone. Cause I find that, <laughs> I find that, um, you know, when you're firing off messages too quick with text that sometimes some, you can misconstrue, like, it, are they mad that I didn't get that done right? Or are they just giving me direction? And so staying on top of your tone and how your like team feels about being managed by you is so important for your overall health. I love Voxer and I would agree with you. I think Voxer somehow, and maybe it's just the vocal piece. I feel like it unifies people so much more. Like I, I use it for my clients. Um, I love it. In fact, I way more prefer it than email. I'd rather just Voxer and then Slack and then call it a day. Personally. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so much easier. I, you know, for people who talk slow, because I, I talk pretty fast. I'm like 4X. And I'm like, yeah. oh. <laughs> it's so great. I love it. It's great. Yeah, it really is. Awesome. So when you're planning the projects for your team, um, do you have a project manager? Do you do the project management? How does that work for you guys? I am the project manager. Um, and part of that is because I think that it's important that messaging and the directive and the mission come from the top. Um, I'm kind of grooming someone that works with us now to um, understand how we um, break down projects and how we put them into the project management software. And so slowly I'm passing that off. But I think that everyone feels more comfortable when they know from the like ultimate decider that this is how I would like this to get done. And this is what the priority is. And this is what the deadline is. And this is the thing that could take a little more time and it's okay. Or we could skip that and it's okay. You know? Um, so that's how we deal with it at this moment. Um, I think it also just depends on the importance of the project too. So like producing a, I don't know, lead magnet. Like I, I talk a lot about project management with our clients and like, uh, ev- there's a big difference between a project and a task. And I think where small business owners get in the weeds is where they make something, a task on their list that is not a one and done, check it off. It's truly a project. It needs to be broken down. Um, but so for something like a lead magnet where we're pulling together like a download and a page and some emails and stuff, I think our team is comfortable with that process enough where I could say, Hey, so-and-so will you, you know, watch how that goes. But, um, for something bigger, um, where the messaging is so important, I do take that ownership. Awesome. What have you found is the best way to manage that project? You talked about Asana. So are you guys just managing an Asana or are you guys doing something different? We use Trello, um, which is similar to Asana. Um, I think with all these project management apps, you just have to test some of them out and see which one works best for you and what kind of learner you are. Sue's a really visual person. So years ago, um, she saw Trello and loved how um, she was able to like color code things and stuff. And so that's just, people ask me why Trello versus Asana versus Monday. I'm like, it's stuck and now it is built and it is a machine and I will not give it up. (laughs) So good. I personally use Monday because I'm super visual too. And so it kind of gave me that visual and colors and I'm like, oh, I can see what's going on. I love Monday because I I like Asana too because I'm pretty, I'm pretty strategic in thinking through line items, but my brain, I just like, I just like visuals. I'm not going to lie. So I like Monday. Once I learned about Monday, man, it's been game over for me. Monday is super cool. It's the newer one. Um, but I love how in it you can adapt the information to yep. different types. So it's like you could change something from a list to a grid to a calendar. That's very cool. Yep. But I didn't have that five years ago. <laughs> and Dotto talked about something the other day because he was, he was angry. Uh, shout out to Steve Dotto. He was upset <laughs> with Asana and they were working on some project. Remember his Facebook post correctly? 
and they had you know the project and a deadline and then within the project there was many deadlines but so when he changed the de the project deadline, it didn't adjust the micro deadlines. And he was like, there has to be a way. And so Asana was like, nope, no way to do it. So he started asking like, is there a way to do this? And apparently there's some software called ClickUp, which oh. is um, very similar to Asana. It's almost, I don't know. I mean, I'd, I'd only looked at it for like three minutes, but it's almost like a hybrid of Trello and Asana kind of meshed into one beautiful looking software. So I'm going to check oh. it out because uh I don't know, maybe it's going to be better than Monday or maybe it's better than Asana. I don't know. I just want to check it out yeah. because it may have um, some good flexibility. Yeah. I'd say I think with all these different softwares, it's really important to, depending on what kind of business owner you are, there's always going to be a new software out there. And totally. so if you've built a system in something, try and like take each new introduction with a grain of salt um, because I just know that you can waste so much time moving from one to the other, to the other. I know you do it for research. It's not like yeah, you're going to move sure. your entire business to this platform and then in two weeks, spend your time doing that. No. But I do know my clients can get like totally overwhelmed. Totally. The other system that I like using too is like old school, uh, just Google sheets. And for me, you, you mentioned Loom, I use Vidyard, same thing, just different piece of software, Chrome, little browser plugin thing. And so I just have like, uh, even for this podcast, like everything that has to be done from the very beginning of planning it out all the way to the end, like each step of the piece of the puzzle. And I just create little loom videos or little Vidyard videos of each little step. Uh, when somebody has a question like, well, how to do this? I just go do it, record myself it. doing it, drop it in there. And then boom, the system's created. And I think a lot of people listening, to this are just like, okay, I have to sit down and think through all of this and create. And now I, I and you and I've had this conversation offline many times. You just kind of do it as you go. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you, you let some, you bring somebody on, you have them do some things. They're like, how do I do that? You're like, I never even thought about that. Let me add that one to the list. Let me go create you a little video. Now you know how to do it. Thank you so much. And you're just building the systems on the fly. And uh, once I understood that for myself, that was a big game changer for creating like systems and processes. And I think so many people make this mistake because they think it's some holy grail arrival place to systematizing a business and it's, it's really not it's just kind of enjoying the journey of it and just kind of creating it as you go it seems to be the easiest uh thing to do have you found that to be true for you too i agree yeah i know process documentation is so important as, especially if you're growing fast and you're finding that you're needing to introduce more and more people into your systems um but like you said i do or did so much of it um I want to say like two years ago, really on the fly, just by noticing like, okay, I'm creating this to-do list again. This is a thing I did two weeks ago. Yep. What were the five things again? Okay, let me file that away in a Google document. Okay, <laughs> now I have this whole Google document. That's all the things that I did to build this landing page and put this thing in Google Analytics and whatever. And now I'm able to easily pass it off. So good. The other thing that I've liked for systems, at least for coaches, course creators, has been James Wedsmore's uh, Business by Design uh, program. It's been brilliant. And it's full of processes. They use um, something street, process street, I believe is a piece of software. And so he's created like all of the, the systems, the processes, and you just click a little button and suck it into process street and it's all there rather than having to create it from scratch. And again, it's, it's really for coaches and course creators and people in the online space, but um, that's a nice little, little hack. If you don't mind spending the money for it, it's been brilliant. I've really enjoyed oh, it. I love it. Yeah. Um, we use Entreport. It's a, it's a CRM and they have pre-built campaigns and you can share your campaigns. Yep. And so like we, we have high end coaching clients, our programs called ready, set grand pro. And I help them not only with Instagram, but like this automation stuff. And we were recently talking about what if we built campaigns for them and just sent them the link and they clicked the button and it showed up in their account? It's like, that's okay. That's next. That would be so game changing. <laughs> it is a game changer. And it's such a, like a brilliant add on in value. And Wedmore has kind of done that for the launch piece by just giving people, here's the steps for a webinar launch. Here's the steps for this type of strategy or this type of strategy, which you guys are doing specifically for what you've seen that works. And I think it's great. Now, the, you know, for those listening, they're like, oh, uh, I'm going to go join pro. I would actually recommend you go join pro. I think that'd be a great move for you. And also, the thing that makes those processes work is 
like inserting your messaging, uh, which you cannot get from any other program. Nobody can do that for you. Like you have to insert you into the process for it to work. So I just want to put that little anchor in for people as, as, as we're listening, because I've seen so many people make the mistake of taking the swipe process or the swipe file, following it verbatim. They're like, why didn't it work? Because it's not you. <laughs> that, that's why it didn't work. <laughs> please, please, please hear this, guys. <laughs> it's so important because, um, I mean, I've been working with online business owners, people looking to like, like you're saying, educators, creators, and the secret sauce really is the authenticity, even though that word is so overused. It just, it's the truth. And your audience can smell it all over you when you're not saying what actually like is true to you. And there's so many ways to adapt a strategy that's worked and put your spin on it. It's so true. Yeah. So how do you go about setting goals for the team? How do you go about tracking those goals for the team? Um, there's a couple of things, um, that are kind of ritualistic at this point. Um, there's yearly and quarterly planning that happens. Um, this is like my, probably my fourth year of building out, um, a full year financial plan and then checking in on it each quarter. Um, almost like when your bookkeeper checks in with you, you know, to reconcile stuff. Um, and a small business is so different than a corporation in that the plan that I had in January could be completely different in March and completely different in April. And you just have no idea, but at least I had the plan to follow and track and see what changed. So I'd say those check-ins, um, building out your plan for the year and doing it quarterly and reflecting back and doing the financial analysis is really important. Um, I also set weekly goals for my team. So we have a channel in Slack. It's just called goals. And every week I give the entire team an update on um, sales if there's a certain promotion going on and our priorities as a group. And sometimes your priorities are the same every week, but it's really good to be reminded what's important because there's so much other stuff that can distract you, whether or not it's personally, professionally, whatever. So I send out the priorities and break down the status of certain projects that we're working on. So the whole team, whether or not it's our graphic designer um, or Sue, you know, that I'm managing for her um, is able to say, like see that our ready set gram students and our pro students are number one. How did it go last week? Let's go check in with them. Like we're talking about things that are, should be pillars of your business, but it's a goal every week that we, um, you know, hit that standing. So, um, yeah, weekly, quarterly, um, yearly, I do use a lot of spreadsheets, you know, Google spreadsheets. I get as much data as I can get my hands on. Um, we set up UTM tracking in Google analytics. I don't know, probably five years ago. It was when Sue had seven Instagram accounts and I was like, something has to be happening here. And the only way to make any decisions is by the numbers. I mean, you can go by your feeling and but if you go by your feeling as a creator, you're like, I need all these things. I must, <laughs> I must create more. <laughs> right. So totally. um, UTM tracking inside of Google analytics um, was originally meant for like ad tracking, like pay-per-click, like, um, but now you can, as long as you use the link that's set for that specific platform, only in that platform, you'll get some pretty good data of understanding how um, your strategies are working across social platforms, across a group of emails, um, in certain places on your website. And so we use those every launch and we also have like kind of standing ones that I'm able to go and see. Like we have this um, free download, the strategy guide, and I'll be able to check and say, so for the last three months, most of the strategy guide leads actually came from YouTube, even though we paid for this advertisement or did this webinar or whatever. And so it just kind of helps you prioritize how much um, you should be working on, um, especially in online business, when you feel like you have to be on every single platform, 
we have scaled larger than we probably thought possible and will continue to by getting rid of more platforms and just focusing on Instagram and Facebook and our email list um, because you're not trying to be everything to everyone. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect <laughs> sense. I'm so glad cool. you said that because I think so many people do think they have to be everywhere. I know that's something we've worked on uh, a lot because you guys had a large Facebook group and I was like, kill it. You're like, oh, build the Facebook what? group. <laughs> Check the links. It's not bringing you shit. Goodbye, Facebook group. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. I want to go love back. killing things. It's great. I want to go back more more to simply. the idea of yearly goals, quarterly goals, small business owners being flexible. Because I think people could read a book like Scaling Up, which is a wonderful book to understand yearly planning and setting your quarterly rocks and then breaking that down. So how do you find that balance between setting the plan and then being flexible and adjustable because life happens, shit happens? Like, how do you, how do you like stay out of that, quag, that quagmire where you're like, fuck, we're, all, we're not hitting our, to, you know, our target, we're behind or this or this is changed? Like, how do you find that dance happen for you? I think so much of it is about mindset and about having processes that you depend on and knowing your purpose and knowing what to do each day. So, I mean, a couple of books that really put it like in perspective for me was Essentialism and 12 Week Year. Um, and Essentialism basically talks to you about like getting rid of as much as possible and only doing what is essential. Um, and 12 Week Year talks to you about running your business as if the quarter is the year instead of the year so that you don't fall into so many lulls. Yep. Um, but I think that the moment that we, like I, both Sue and I are almost always on the same page about something a team member needs and about like this next idea and you know what to do about it. And I think it's because we block out noise and competition and don't spend time looking at things that will upset us or take us off track. Awesome. And because we're so confident in the processes that we do have that, so if we didn't take that, um, that random shiny object and take it off, like, would we still be good? Are we still happy with what we're doing today? Um, okay. So if we are then, so what do we think about that shiny thing? Do we, you want to do it or not? What do we think? Hmm, okay. Yes. No. How do we bring, you know what I mean? So I, so much of it has to do with coming, getting over the distraction of seeing what other people are doing and the jealousy of other people's businesses and concern over not being good enough. And instead considering that, you know, having that peace with your business and your mission and who you help and be proud of the products that you create, um, which then make new opportunities and more interesting things, something to play out. Also, if you have all of this documented, you make a duplicate of the sheet that you were creating and you say, well, what if I didn't do that? And what if I did shift it? And what does that look like three months from now or six months from now? You can make a calculated choice. Awesome. Awesome. How much time do you set aside each week to kind of plan those weekly goals? Um, I'd say dep it depends on the week, but no more than an hour or two, really. Awesome. Um, on a Monday, you know, cause I'm able to go in and assess everything and then do that goals post for everyone. Um, but then to do it with it quarterly or do it yearly, you set aside a day or two. Perfect. Perfect. Now, do you do like uh, team member reviews or anything with your team? Yeah, um, we are about to do it twice a year, did it once a year. But um, like we just talked about how things can change so rapidly. Um, I want to give people more opportunities to communicate about what they need, not um, let time fly by. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So you're using the reviews, if, it, if I'm hearing you correctly, for them to be able to communicate to you what they would like to feel changed rather than you communicating to them what you would like them to change. A little bit of both. Um, one, I don't let things sit for that long. So if I need something to change, it's changing now. <laughs> um, so I don't need to wait for a review in order to have a, that conversation um, because we're all so 
I'd say happy to be there and proud of our work that we all have that same goal to improve something if there's a problem. And so we very easily could hop on a box and resolve it in a half an hour. Um, so we do give, um, we review um, the things that like the top things that we are like super proud of and any suggested changes if we'd need it. But then there is an open spot specifically to hear how um, the team member felt about what things are going. And also, like you talked about a little bit earlier, like what is the path that they see themselves taking in the business? And like, does that align with us um, and what we need? Um, so a little bit both. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you've seen people make when it comes to managing virtual team? Or what are some of the big mistakes that you've made when managing a virtual team? Um, I love this question and I have a couple, but I'm sure I have so many. <laughs> um, the first thing is to not take too many excuses because you think someone is irreplaceable because no one is irreplaceable. Uh, so good. I'm not irreplaceable. You're not so irreplaceable. Good. <laughs> um, so good. And, um, you know, that can come as a, um, coach as a consultant as you and I are, but also with team members. Um, and so we've definitely made the mistake of hanging on to people too long, thinking that they're the magic or thinking that they're the secret sauce. And you really have to take your emotions out of it and consider things pragmatically when you're at that point, because the truth is you really do not know what's possible when you take that off of your shoulders. And so you got to try. Um, so I would say, like, consider that. Consider how much your emotions are carrying, what decisions that you're making, because it's business. It's not personal. Um, the Another thing would be I've taken too much of a hands-off approach with management, I think, can lead to errors that are so unintentional. And so, like I said, messaging leadership has to come from the top. Um, and so if I ever um, kind of was like, they can handle that, or I'm not going to build out the project plan, or they don't need the reference document that explains it, um, that's lazy on my part, because something that takes me one hour would help my team stay on track for two weeks, three weeks. So I'd say there's, a, there's such a balance between making sure that you have that open level of communication and that you're truly delegating so that you can focus on your business scaling, but also that you're not too hands off that yeah. um, things get lost and then everyone's upset. It's no fun. <laughs> now, if you could go back in time and give your younger self some wisdom that would help the young Morgan collapse some time and generate the results faster, what would you tell her? Um, so much of it is, um, like trust yourself and rip off the bandaid. What's the bandaid that you would want that you would tell her to rip off? Um, just like your, like I just shared with, um, the irreplaceableness of, of team members, you know, if there's been any difficult decision, there's so much time wasted by grappling over what choice to make and stressing over what if. And so I just, if you pull off that bandaid and you see what happens, as long as you are making decisions in integrity and you're like being truthful and honest with the choices that you're making. And if you want to leave a door open, leave it open, you know, but pull off the bandaid instead of wasting your time over it. Um, that's I think huge. Another thing that I would say is simplify, like stop trying to be everything for everyone. Um, get really good at one thing, two things and make one or two really solid offerings. And instead of thinking that it's the thing that you've created that's wrong and that you have to do something else, look at the thing that you created and see how you could do to improve it. Awesome. Um, because that has been the biggest game changer for us. We're making more money with less products um, than ever before. It's really, 
and it's way easier on you. You don't have to have to maintain all these different products. Like, come on. Yeah. And it kind of simplifies the whole business model, simplifies the processes and the systems and the hiring and the mental bandwidth and all of that. Exactly. Awesome. Exactly. So if somebody takes your advice today, what do you know is possible for them? Gosh, anything you want, really. I know. Gosh, I'm, I know. I'm sorry. Woo woo here. Literally anything that you want to create. Um, if I've learned anything from AJ. Um, the, it's, it's just true. I mean, I, when I was 20, this is exactly what I wanted. When I was 23, I never thought it was possible. Mm. So you just have to like, stay the course, stay committed. There are so many people in this industry that are on their second and third job from when we met them seven years ago. And instead we stayed committed and, um, you can, you can create what you, what you want, you know, for real. Like I'm, I'm so excited by the, the numbers I'm running and the team that I get to support and like what, what we're planning for 2021 and 2022. And it's like, sorry, what year, huh? <laughs> but <laughs> that's what we get to enjoy. It's great. So good. Well, thank you so much for being here. If people want to learn yeah. about you, they want to connect with Sue, uh, your whole organization, just go to suebzimmerman.com. You guys have all kinds of free stuff when it comes to like using Instagram to generate leads, make consistent revenue. Uh, from hashtags to ready, set, gram. That's what, like your key signature course that teaches um, people how to get followers, make sales. You guys have pro for the advanced people. Anything else I'm missing? Um, no, yeah, those are our main. Um, <laughs> play and you can find us at the Instagram expert on Instagram if you're just looking for some quick tips and resources. Um, we're there every day. You can always shoot a DM or connect, like you said, at subizimmerman.com. Or on YouTube. You guys have your YouTube show as well. We have a fabulous YouTube channel too. It's true. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Well, Morgan, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there you have it, my friend, the amazing Morgan Sutton. She's so freaking smart. It like blows my mind. I hope this episode has served you. I know it has me because like I'm in the middle of continuing to create processes and learning to lead my team strategically. And so this was like just full of some really good wisdom uh, that I can implement personally. So I feel like we've covered a lot of ground here. Hope it served you. But before I let you go, I just want to give you a quick reminder that I'm posting all sorts of great stuff over on Facebook to help you have more peace, power, and profits. So please go connect with me on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash AJ Amix. So go check that out when you're done with this podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Until next time, my friend, I'm out. Peace. Well, that's all I've got for this episode of the Anthony John Amix podcast. But we have plenty more to help you become unstoppable in life and business. So head on over to ajamix.com for exclusive resources, information, and tools to help you break through to a new level of freedom, purpose, and success. I look forward to having you back for the next episode. Bye for now.